Um, good afternoon, and um, I'd like you to say a warm welcome to Patrick Brennan, who is New Zealand's bravest man. <laughs> Well, um, can you all hear me to start with? Who said no? Who was that? Chocolate fish, penguin food. Okay, let me start by saying I'm not New Zealand's bravest man. I've come here to talk to you about New Zealand's bravest man. Uh, my name is Patrick Brennan. I work for a company called Open System Specialists, and I've come to tell you a little bit about Albany Senior High School today. Now, um, I don't know, a couple of months back when uh, OSS asked me to put in a submission to LinuxConf, to be honest, I was thinking, well, you know, it's 500 words to write, it's easy, I'll come down, I'll stay in a hotel, I can expense claim some dinners, I'll get a nice train ride down, it's 12 hours of scenery, uh, sorry, 6 hours of scenery, 12 hour ride if you ever do the train ride down from Auckland. Um, and to be honest, it all feels a little bit different. Now I'm standing up here on stage and you all look very small down there. But it is a privilege, it is an absolute privilege to be here. This is my first Linux Conf, and to be standing on stage and, and addressing you all is, is an honor, really. Um, going to have some non-technical content and some technical content today. There's lots and lots and lots to cover, so I, I'm going to be talking really, really fast. Um, if you guys are paying attention, I have rewards for you. So who wants some chocolate? Yeah. <laughs> kind of missed who was first there, but... <laughs> I was going to say, I'm not renowned for my throwing, but actually I am. I'm particularly renowned for my bad throwing. So, a little bit about me. There's a whole bunch there. I'm not going to talk through it, but the main thing is I've been involved in um, open source commercially for around 11 years, and I was the lead engineer on the Albany Senior High project. Now, that doesn't mean that I was in charge or anything. It just simply means that I was involved with the project first. So, who is the bravest man in New Zealand? Well, the bravest man in New Zealand, in my opinion right now, is Mark Osborne. Mark Osborne is the deputy principal of Albany Senior High. He is sitting right down there. Wave, Mark. Um, some of you may have some of you may have heard him speak already. He has uh, addressed us uh, a couple of times, and we'll come back around in a minute to why I believe he is the bravest man in New Zealand. Now, Albany Senior High School. Just a little bit about them. They're in, in Auckland, in the Albany region. They're a greenfield school, so a brand new school. It's a fantastic opportunity to do everything from the ground up without having to worry about existing hardware, supporting existing systems, existing processes, existing software, just everything from complete scratch. Um, they're a Ministry of Education flagship school. They're the first state integrated senior high in New Zealand. Um, there's a whole bunch of vision and stuff that um, Mark's already spoken about, but I just thought I'd talk about a few of the things that you might see that are different if you were to walk into Albany Senior High as an IT person or as a parent or as whatever you are. And the first thing that stands out to me when you walk into the school is there are no classrooms. There are no classrooms. There are what are called learning commons, which are big open areas. You might have four or five classes in a learning common at a time. So you can see the theme open coming through in the school already. Now, the idea of that is that you can get interaction between classes. You can get a geography teacher that's teaching the geography of Europe, interacting with a class who might be studying the history of World War II, interacting with an English class who might be studying Anne Frank's diary. So it's about openness. The, cl the school teaches four days a week, and on the fifth day, students are undertaking a self-driven research project. Now, um, I mention this because um, one of the students, and we actually have students here today, one of the students um, undertook a project that I would talk about a little bit, a little bit further on. So um, it's an open school. Open learning lends itself really, really well to open source. And um, again, it, just, it really stands out to me that we actually have students from Albany Senior High here today because I don't know if you can think back to when you were in school and imagine being taken along to a conference of this nature and this caliber, it's just, it, it must be unreal. Okay, so why is Mark Osborne the bravest man in New Zealand? Well, who, who here has any involvement in the education industry? I'm going to run out of fish really quick. <laughs> just a few of you. Whoops. We'll go with short. There we go. I'll just trust you guys to pass those around appropriately to where I am. Um, <clears throat> hey, hey. <laughs> Woo! 
You see, what you've gone and done there is you've gone and ruined it for the entire front row now. All right, so the education space is Microsoft-focused. Um, it's heavily, heavily subsidized by the government, and all of the design patterns, all of the reference designs are Microsoft. You go to build a school, you go to an IT provider, you'll get Active Directory, you'll get a few servers, you'll get this, that, you know, you'll get Windows applications that teachers are using. It's all based around Microsoft. Um, interestingly, there's also a perception that, that students should train with real-world products. Now, I'll give you a really good example of this. I'm a musician, and so I'm quite interested in, in the musical capabilities of Linux. There's Ardell, there's LMMS, there's Hydrogen. There's a whole bunch of applications, Jack, what have you. Now, I was talking with a music teacher um, who wanted OSX machines so that he could run Pro Tools, which is, for those not familiar, is not unlike Ardell. It's just a multi-tracker studio. And... Um, I said, you know, we can put some of this on, on these Linux machines for you. You can use this stuff. You can teach with this stuff. And his response to that was, I want students to use what they're going to use in the real world. What they're going to use in the real world. Now, there is an element of truth in what he's saying, in that if you walk into a recording studio at the moment, you're probably going to use Pro Tools or Cubase. But... A school of maybe, I don't know, 600 students might have four OSX machines with Pro Tools on because Pro Tools is very expensive. How many of those 600 students that want to do you think are going to get to spend time using that? Wouldn't it be better to have an application that's free, free as in beer, free as in open, across all of the 100 desktops in the school, so that even though maybe it's not quite the same, you can learn the concepts, you can learn how to learn this stuff, and everyone can have access to it. Personally, I think that's a much better way. Now, a year and a half ago, Mark approached us. He had no teaching staff. He had no IT support. He had a vision, but he had no real confirmation, that, external confirmation at least, that his vision was achievable. And um, he went out and purchased 30 laptops, whacked Ubuntu on them, staff started turning up and he handed them out. Here is your laptop, has Ubuntu on it. Now, I was actually really, really surprised because I expected a considerable amount of resistance. I expected this, you know, this is different, this doesn't work, how do I do this? And it just wasn't there. Teachers just used it. I arrived on site and teachers had laptops running Ubuntu connected to their projector. Now, I don't know how many speakers you've seen up here going, for goodness sake, how do I make this work? It's just teachers plug it in, works, click, and, and they, were, they were willing to explore. They were willing to broaden their horizons. They were willing to broaden their boundaries. And if you take that for teachers who are often older people, not necessarily as IT literate, how much more so is that for students who love exploring, who love looking, who love figuring out how things work? Okay, now there was only one teacher that was really kind of a little bit obnoxious about Linux, and to be honest, had we put Windows XP on his machine, you could have substituted everything he said. Every time you used the word Linux, you could have used the word computer. You know, no, 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 Linux. Well, on the other side of the coin, no, 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 computer. Okay, yelling at computers is OS independent. I don't think that's an excuse for not deploying open source. This is a very, very good example. This is a picture of one of our sales staff's screen. He runs Windows XP, not Linux. He got so frustrated with his machine, he tried to throw his wireless mouse across the room before he discovered that it wasn't a wireless mouse. It was attached. <laughs> and the cable carefully directed his wireless mouse straight into the center of his screen, which I'm sure made the problem worse, not better. So Mark presented us with a vision, and it was a big vision. It was this big. It was this big. Mark said, I want to use open source everywhere. I want students to be able to use the same software that they can in the school, the same software that they're learning with. I want them to be able to take it home and use it at home. I want them to be able to take it home and use it on their laptop, on their desktop, on their whatever, on more than one machine without paying an uh, educational license here and an educational license there and an educational license here, there and everywhere. He wanted to leverage the cloud. He wanted to minimize the on-site infrastructure and push whatever he could into the wishy-washy concept that you might call the cloud out there. He also wanted single credential or single sign-on, but at the very least single credential across 
all of those internal systems, but also all of that external stuff that's magically appearing on the school in the cloud. And he wanted to have a great holiday. I'll be back right before school starts. Let me know how it goes. So it was quite a tight timeline, and I think, it's quite interesting what you can deploy in open source in that period of time. We spent two weeks evaluating technologies. We spent a week designing, and we spent two weeks implementing. And although everything wasn't as polished as it could have been, and everything wasn't quite there, when the school opened with that deadline, all of the core functionality was there. Users could use desktops. Users could use all of their applications, centralized credentials. All of that worked, and to my mind, that was actually a fairly impressive undertaking. So, um, thank you. Who clapped first? <laughs> really? Oh, well, that's okay, because I threw it to the guy behind him anyway. <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to do is... Um, I don't have time to talk through the whole lot. I, I don't really even have time to talk through the slides I have. So there's a couple of interesting technological areas that I, I will go to in, in a little bit of detail, and then we'll have some question and answers at the end. Um, what I would do is um, bring up one of my colleagues, Glenn Ogilvy, um, and also Mark Osborne as well, so that we can field questions, whether they're technical or about the philosophy of the school. Uh, and so on and so forth. So there were some design precepts, some of them we've mentioned already. Um, minimal on-site infrastructure, obviously. Maximizing the use of open source products. Linux from end to end. Linux on the servers, Linux on the desktops. Um, had there been Linux switch? Well, in fact, the allied tell us the switches run Linux inside anyway, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend those to anyone. Centralized credentials for all services. Now that's whether they're internal or external. He also wanted students, and this is quite interesting and quite unique, he wanted students to be able to bring devices in, whatever they were, whether it was a PSP, whether it was an XP laptop, Vista laptop, Linux laptop, iPhone, what else is there? There's a whole bunch of stuff, you get the idea. And connect it to the network. And expect it to work, expect to be able to browse the web and use that as a learning tool. And so one of the design precepts for us was actually hostile network. We didn't have this concept of, uh, although we do have an internal LAN, we didn't have this concept of a nice, safe internal LAN with controlled devices talking to servers. We have this concept where any student can potentially plug any device into that network segment. Um, he wanted all of the usual business needs, you know, flexibility, scalability, reliability, resilience, usability. That's one that's often missed. And um, the system as it stands, we'd expect to scale through to probably around 600 clients without needing any additional hardware addressing other than additional clients, obviously. Now, um, all of the desktops have Ubuntu on them. That was a, a choice that, that Mac made. It wasn't really a design choice. It's, it's a common OS. It's familiar to a lot of people. It's not an unreasonable choice, but it could potentially be any OS. The same with the servers. Um, we utilize Mandriva. The reason that we utilize Mandriva is because we utilize Mandriva directory server. Uh, and that's basically a web-based console for managing your LDAP directory. Um, obviously, Mandriva directory server is easier to deploy on Mandriva than it is to deploy on Ubuntu. But again, it's neither here nor there. It's, it's Linux. Um, it could have equally been RHEL if you're wanting to pay thousands of dollars in commercial support um, and want that security blanket. It's, it's a risk. It's a business risk decision, really. We put in four physical servers, uh, a firewall, which is obviously always desirable to be physical if possible, a storage server with a 10 gig interface out into a switch. Who's seen 10 gig in the real world? Okay. Keep your hand up if you've seen it in a school before. Really? A university or a school? Wow. That deserves chocolate fish. Whoop. Hang on. Deserves two chocolate fish. Okay, so a storage server and uh, two hypervisors. Okay, that is a, a considerably, considerably lower tin count than the norm. Now, when we did this, the school was in a temporary premises. Now the school has moved into a full-time premises, and that's uh, been a permanent premises, I should say. It's been designed by architects. It's been specified by data cabling companies, and they built a server room. And in that server room, they put racks for servers. Does anyone want to guess 
how many racks these professional art- architects who are used to doing this sort of thing felt we would need. Okay. Eight is the closest answer I have so far. Seven racks. Seven. Did she? Oh, look at that. You can have two. One could be an apology for not hearing you the first time. Seven racks. Okay, one, one PA rack, so let's discount that. Two racks for switches in, so let's discount those. That's four racks. Four racks for servers. That was their expectation that we would need. What's 48 times four? Who can do that? There we go. One of my colleagues did it. That's embarrassing. <laughs> 192 RU is what they expected us to need to support the school. And we're supporting the school with four servers. Okay, there is also a, uh, a managed layer two switching fabric, which um, we'll ignore here. Okay. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about cloud services. Google Mail was used for the school domain, so there's no internal mail server whatsoever. Uh, Google Docs was used for the school's collaboration. So while OpenOffice is installed locally, there's not necessarily any reason for people to use it. Students can come in and collaborate on their docs from wherever they are, whether they're inside the school, outside the school. Moodle, which will probably be familiar to a lot of you, is hosted by Catalyst for Albany. It's their learning management system. Mahara, which is used for uh, managing student e-portfolios. Um, it's also used for generating things like staff reviews and lots of clever stuff. And Koha. Now, Koha is a bit of particular note. It's a library management package, but it was written in New Zealand. And um, Albany looked at it and said, yes, we like this. We want to do this. But you know what? We want, we want some changes in book recommendations. We want to change the way this works. We want this to work uh, against our central credentials, so we need Aldap S support. And Albany was actually able to commission that and commission Koha to write that and now that functionality is available to other schools and other people who are signing up to the Koha software. So again, this is a fundamental difference from the Microsoft model, where school A may buy a package and they may want some changes to it, so they have it customized. And then school B buys a package and they may want to have some changes to it, and so they have it customized. Now ultimately, in both of those cases, I mean, the schools are paying separately, but the Ministry of Education is paying for both. When you boil it down, the MOE pays the school, the school pays the developer. So isn't it much, much better then to have that payment happen once? MOE gave some money to Albany, Albany gave some money to Koha. That functionality is now available for all schools or any other users in New Zealand. Sorry? Yeah, I had a typo on my first slide too, so... Um, but that one got fixed because I just happened to um, flick the slide up in the, in the break. So I am sure that there are other typos. The best thing about the typo on the first slide was apparently somebody had already told me about it and I had neglected to fix it. Anyway, who was that typo? There. Here you go. <laughs> All right. Gentle. Goodness me. All right. Clients, um, not going to talk too much about them. Um, they're imaged using PXE. We don't really have time to talk about why, but um, it's important to note that these are not thin clients. These are locally installed clients. They're very, very powerful machines. We're talking about 19-inch uh, monitors, dual-core machines, 4 gig of RAM, NVIDIA graphics cards, which we were able to get at a very, very good price. We were very, very pleased. And to have that kind of hardware sitting on a school, and, and these, aren't, these are student desktops. These are not the back office, uh, office administrators sitting around. This is what you know, your son, your daughter, whatever, if you're old enough, to come into a school, come into the college, will sit and use. And that's, again, that's unusual to, um, to see that. Users' home directories are mounted, uh, NFS mounted to the file server. So all of the users' settings, all of the users' documents and whatnot all traverse around with them. So. Essentially, it's like roaming profiles without the nightmare of roaming profiles and without the nightmare of copying stuff around and around. Um, users authenticate to the storage server and firewall with PAM. Who here understands PAM? There's a lot of liars in the room today. <laughs> I know, the two of you that kept your hands up when I called you liars can have chocolate fish. <laughs> 
All right. There are also some OSX clients that aren't integrated, um, but we won't talk about those. Now, um, we used KVM rather than Zen. Um, it was available. It's the direction that uh, the Linux kernel is really going in terms of virtualization. Not really going to talk about it much other than to say we're really, really pleased with it. And it enabled us to deploy whatever we needed. So we deployed an LDAP server, a DNS server, DHCP server, so on and so forth, and all the core elements we needed. When the when the PABX was selected and the PABX guys came in and, and put their machine in the rack and said, look, we need a desktop to run this Windows XP application, which is exactly what you want sitting in your server stack, a desktop running Windows XP. We said, sure, we can do that for you because we can just deploy another instance with XP. And we had the same issue. There are a couple of, um, although there's inroads, but there are a couple of Windows-specific applications in terms of student management that the MOE requires at the moment. And again, we were just able to deploy Windows instances for those. So it was very, very flexible. It's worked out very, very well for the school. All of the VLANs, or most of the VLANs on the network, are trunked into each hypervisor. So with the libvirt, I don't know who's seen libvirt here. Cool. So libvirt is a GUI application where you can say, oh, file new, create me a new machine. Um, with all the VLANs trunked in, we're able to say, OK, well, that machine's in the internal VLAN, or that machine's in the student DMZ, or that machine's in the DMZ. With LVM, for the disks underneath, we're able to say, OK, allocate this much chunk of disk, or grow this disk, or shrink this disk. So it's very, very flexible and very, very fast to deploy new instances, or delete old instances, or alter instances within the school. A little bit about the storage server. It's 7 terabytes of RAID 6 storage. Um, it's serial attached SCSI for the school to keep the cost down. The two hypervisors are SAS um, and 10 gig uh, Ethernet we've already mentioned. Now, we had to use NFS4. Who here has used NFS4? Who here has used NFS4 with Kerberos? Yeah. Did you enjoy it? Is <laughs> a reward. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. It's great. I should have frozen them. <laughs> so um, one of the fundamental issues with NFS, when you're dealing with one of our design presets, which is a hostile network, is NFS is UID based. If you trust the network, that's fine. But NFS trusts, the server trusts whatever UID you present to it. So if I can connect my laptop or my PSP running Linux or whatever it is that I've got that I have root access on, and I can claim that my UID is 1,000, which actually belongs to Mark Osborne, then I can read, alter, delete, change, whatever, all of his files. Okay? So to resolve that, you have to use NFS4 with Kerberos. Okay? Very, very briefly, how this works is each machine has a, a desktop has a machine ticket. It uses that ticket to mount slash home when it boots. At that stage, all of the file access happens as the user nobody, which in NFS4 is 4 million and something. There'll be some C programmer out there that knows what that value is. When a user logs in, they're issued a Kerberos ticket. At that point, all of their operations on that home file share happen as their UID based on their name in their Kerberos ticket. So if you can't get a Kerberos ticket with the name Patrick in it, for example, then you can't pretend that you're me and you can't read my files. So we can be absolutely certain with Kerberos, although it adds layers of complexity, that um, a user is who they say they are. Now, backups, yes, we're using backups. Not really going to talk about them anymore. This is what happens when you only have 45 minutes. Now, firewall. Firewall I did want to talk about a little bit because it's quite interesting. And I have some volunteers who I'd like to invite up now. Now, anytime now, be great. Thank you. To, um, to help me explain that, because um, we used a product called NUFW. And um, NUFW is an authenticating firewall. It's quite unique. It builds on IP tables, but it happens in user space. Right, so how this is going to work is uh, Shane's going to climb onto Mark's shoulders, Glenn's going to, no. <laughs> See their faces, that was great. <laughs> we'll put Mark in the middle. This is Mark Osborne, for those who haven't met him. He is the Deputy Principal of Amity Senior High. Okay. 
Glenn Ogilvie, who's one of my colleagues who was involved in the project, will put over here. Anatoly Kern, who's one of my pro uh, colleagues who wasn't involved in the project, but he's a smiley face, so he'll do. We'll put him over here. Now, Shane. Shane is one of the students uh, at Albany, and um, Shane is going to be our packet. So, Shane, go and stand over by Glenn there. Right. So, basically, how NUFW works is um, Glenn, um, Glenn doesn't know it yet, but Glenn's got a bit of a thing for Anatoly over here. And, um, and I've got the microphone, so this is all good. I'll pay for it later, I'm sure. Now, what's going to happen is, is Glenn's also a bit of a geek, so he's thinking about sending Anatoly a love message. And um, he's thinking SSH might be the most appropriate way to do that as a geek. And um, so what Glenn does is um, dispatches his SSH packet, who's going to try and traverse the firewall. Now, the firewall is going to stop him. Now, um, now, this is... Right, uh, this is your chance to be a little bit physical with a student, Mark, because I know, you know, <laughs> as a DP, you're, you know, in charge of discipline. Okay, so what Mark, as the firewall, is going to do now is say, well, I've got this packet. I don't have any IP tables rules to let it pass me. So I'm going to talk back to the agent that's running over here. Now, I'll just pause there because there are a couple of different ways that this can work. On Glenn here, under Windows or under OS X or even under Linux, say on the teacher laptops, there can be a little agent in the system tray that enables you to authenticate against NUFW. So it's a, a fancy inside cryptographic protocol. On the desktops, we're using a PAM module. So the user, when they log in as PAM, they're authenticated at that point to the firewall. So what happens is Mark calls back over to, uh, to Glenn there and says, Oi, you, who's the user that initiated this TCP connection? And what is the application? And this is really interesting. What is the application that initiated this TCP connection? And Glenn calls back and he says, well, um, I can see these, these, all of this information in my TCP state table. And um, yes, I know that this user who is authenticated to the firewall, and this is all tied back together with LDAP. And uh, you have to bear in mind that I'm simplifying a bit. We're going to do this in sort of four steps. There's more like 11 or 12. We just don't have time for that. So now Mark gets a response from the agent or PAM. And Mark knows where this packet came from. He knows who it came from. He knows the IP address it came from. He knows all of the usual TCP stuff that you get, ports, IPs, whatnot. And he knows the application. So Mark can now look in his firewall rule set, and he can say, ah, I see that, uh, that Glenn is trying to send a, a love message to Anatoly over here. He's trying to send it on port 22. And it came from SSH. And Glenn's in the admin group, so we can deal with essentially almost any LDAP attribute, but he's in the admin group. So I'll let that packet pass. And then Shane can trundle on by and deliver the message which Anatoly is clearly pleased with. <laughs> now, what we've done now in the firewall is this all happens in user space. So this is fast enough on fast enough hardware, but it's not lightning fast. It's not, you know, IP table, state table fast. But we've now established a state. So when Shane heads back with the, the, the SYNAC at this stage, we've had a syn, SYNAC going back, he can go around the firewall through the firewall state table. And because that state exists while that TCP session is alive, if Glenn has more love to send to Anatoly, which is fantastic, Glenn, we can keep passing that, yeah, <laughs> until Anatoly decides to send back a reset. At that stage, it's all over. So thanks, guys. You, you can sit down. You guys probably deserve some of these. So. <laughs> you know, I put these in buckets because I thought chocolate fish, I thought penguin food, it's kind of fitting, and I just, I have this urge to. <laughs> but I, we'll see how many are left at the end. It might, it might get that bad yet. Okay. Some of the Twitters. 
Excellent. <laughs> I guess I'll catch up on those later. Okay. So um, one thing I haven't mentioned is that it also allows us to log traffic. It allows us to log traffic per user, per application. So not just your normal squid kind of proxy. Squid, here we go. Fish jokes. Not just your normal squid proxy logging URL, but it enables us to say that this user established this packet to these arbitrary ports uh, and with this application. Um, it also enabled us to do things like uh, one of the impact projects that I mentioned earlier was Shane identified the need in the school for a video server, uh, like an internal YouTube for students to stick videos on and so forth. And so as, as his impact project, he set about deploying that. And we were able to deploy him a virtual instance, set up a student VLAN, and say, OK, well, Shane's in the uh, video group, and therefore Shane is allowed to SSH into the server to manage it. Now, that happens on the firewall. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the uh, defense in depth that, say, OWASP would be proponents of, for example, where you have many, many layers of security. And it means that we're just adding a whole other layer. We've got that firewall layer in between as well. And it means things like, uh, as a usefulness factor, if I go out to Albany School, or if I go out to another client and I want to connect to the management servers, uh, the management interfaces on the servers, and I, I walk up to the ports and I go, well, I can't really remember what port it was, and I figure that out and maybe assign a new port, and then I plug a cable, and then it's uncomfortable sitting in front of the rack, and then I discover that actually there's no DHCP in the management VLAN. I can't remember what the IP scope is anymore, and then I can't remember what the gateway is. And by this time, I'm starting to shout at my machine a little bit. And um, if you're using NUFW, it means that what we can do is walk in, sit down at a desktop that's comfortable, log in, and pass packets into that management VLAN through the firewall on the basis that the firewall has authenticated those packets as coming from me. It also means perhaps you could do clever things like maybe you want to allow evolution to talk outbound on port 25 for whatever reason, but you don't want to allow Telnet to talk outbound on port 25. Okay, it also forms the basis of true SSO because the firewall always knows who the packets that are traversing it belong to. So if you can get that information out to the web server, and we'll come around to that in a little bit, then you, um, you're not having to deal with how do we pass these tokens around, how do we maybe get a Kerberos ticket out into the, into the wild world. Yeah, it's worth briefly touching on web filtering, because it was uh, something that actually saved the school a lot of money uh, using an open source solution. Um, the Ministry of Education funds Watchdog to do web filtering. Uh, it's free for schools, therefore, to have filtering up to 10 megabits. And how that works is Watchdog bowl out, they unplug your internet, ethernet, they plug it into their Cisco box, they plug your internet, ethernet, you know, your LAN into it. So basically, there's a Cisco box that came out very badly. There is a Cisco box that sits between the internet and the firewall, and that passes packets out to Watchdog. And it's, a, it's essentially a risk mitigation issue for schools. Now... Albany is on the, on the vector fiber loop, the Neil Education Access Loop, and that provides them with a gigabit connection, on which currently Mark is buying 100 megabits for, what's the current role? 200, 230 students last year was the current role, 100 megabits. So you can anticipate that that 100 megabits, particularly with the kind of rich educational environment nowadays and sticking everything in the cloud, is going to need to expand. Now, to support up to 100 megabits, through Watchdog, you have to buy a $5,000 Cisco device. The ongoing cost is still covered, but the device you have to go out and buy. To support a gigabit, the cost is unknown. Okay? To do this with a Linux firewall that you already had to install anyway, it's free. It's a little bit of configuration work. Watchdog are actually very, very Linux friendly and very, very interested in making that work. So again, another very, very good example of an actual cost saving not a virtual transitive, but a real physical cost saving, that if we had wanted to support 100 meg, we would have had to spend $5,000. A gig, all bets are off. Okay. Credentials, um, just blast through this really, really briefly, because I want to leave time for, for questions. But um, there is an LDAP replica that sits in the DMZ, and it exposes LDAP S. So Moodle, Mahara, Kema, uh, sorry, Koha, all authenticate just by trying to bind to the user that's providing their credentials. So that's single credentials. Google Docs supports SAML. Who understands SAML here? Wow. It's astonishing. It's a room full of clever people. SAML is really, really complicated and 
Where were you? That's going to go well, isn't it? <laughs> it's all right. I'm just feeling the pressure. Ah, there we go. All right. SAML is really, really complicated, and uh, I'm going to really gloss over the details, but basically how it works is um, I might choose to try and log into Google Mail, and Google Mail redirects me with a little SAML token back to a web server that's at Albany in the DMZ. And that web server prompts me to put in my username and password, which it then authenticates against the local ALDAP server. If that is authenticated successfully, it then redirects me back to Google with another SAML token saying, yes, I've authenticated this user, let them in. Okay. Now, I was talking a little bit earlier about um, single sign-on in the firewall. It turns out that there is actually an Apache module that will talk to NUFW. So there is no reason, although this isn't implemented yet, there is no reason that you can't say, okay, well, this Apache web server that's running here that's asking me to put my username and password in and authenticate them against ALDAP can instead say, actually, I know where that packet came from. I know who that packet came from. I'll verify that with a firewall. Yes, it's that user, and send them straight back to Google for inside the network, at least. So NUFW can be a fundamental part of a single sign-on solution for a lot of stuff that you wouldn't think would necessarily be easy to do single sign-on with, okay? And in that scenario, if there were an external user accessing, they still get redirected to the same page, and they could be prompted to enter their username and password in the same way that they are now. Now, I would like to just invite uh, Glenn and Mark to start heading this way. Um, one thing that I would mention is um, the system was put in at the start of the last school year. It hasn't really been touched in any fundamental way since then. And um, to be honest, I, I didn't really see that until it was pointed out to me. Because as, as one of the design engineers, I was very focused on, you know, there's this and there's maybe that could be a little bit more polished and this could be fixed around the edges. But in actual fact, it's been running. It's been running reliably for a year. And um, so we're very pleased with that. Now, um, we've got, what, about five minutes for some questions. Um, so again... We've got Mark Osborne, uh, myself, and Glenn Ogilvy, and a microphone somewhere. Do you have a microphone? Can I ask? Um, the, how, does, how does the firewall NUFW know that it's actually talking to evolution and not like a sim link to Telnet? Like, uh, how does the agent ch check it? That's, yeah, that's definitely a question for Glenn. Yeah. It trusts the agent um, to tell it what application it is. If you compromise the agent, which you could because it runs on your local machine, then you only have the username and password for it to go on because you can't fake that without knowing someone else's password. But you could potentially falsify the application if you had to. You're welcome. Hi, one question for Mark, other for Glenn. Uh, for Mark, as a, as a parent, I have a nine years old in a small rural North Otago school with electronic whiteboards and all the stuff. How many years do you think that this small mar miracle that you had in Albany would happen in a normal school in normal New Zealand? How many years? Before this start to happen generally. Um, uh, next year? Maybe? No. <laughs> okay, I'd, next I'd, question. <laughs> yeah, I would love for every school in the country to be, to be um, free and open. Um, and there's a lot of, as Patrick outlined, there's a lot of, um, a lot of barriers to that. But um, there are definitely schools that are existing schools. We we're a greenfield site, so we we're really lucky. But um, there are existing schools that are beginning the process of moving to having a, a, an open um, stack basically a Linux stack, which is really heartening because we've shown that it's possible um, and they're actually listening, so it's, it's moving. Yeah, just to expand on what Mark said, there are actually two other schools that I'm aware of in, uh, in New Zealand at the moment that are heading down that path. But again, they're not greenfield schools, so making a massive wholesale change like that is a lot more complicated. Thank you. Glenn, can you use this equipment, for example, for teach new things, for example, parallel programming for high school students? Sorry, I didn't quite catch the question. If you, can, if you have enough equipment, for example, to teach 
new techniques of programming, for example, parallelism on multi-core chips. If you have been doing radical things, why you don't go another step further? Um, we didn't develop the software. The software already exists. So um, I'm, I'm, I think that's tr I'm, I'm not sure. Talk to me after the break. Um, a question for Mark. Um, I believe, uh, obviously, the, um, the Ministry of Education, you know, obviously buys all this subsidized stuff from Microsoft and whatnot. And were you able to actually get some money back off them because you're not using what they uh, would otherwise provide? No. Um, Nathan Parker at um, Warrington Schools tried really hard to do that, and he's become a bit of a bit of a thorn in the side of the Ministry of Education. The, the brilliance of Microsoft's business model is that they get the same amount of money regardless of who uses it. Um, it's, in hindsight, is there anything that you regret or over-engineered, or has it all just worked out? If you did it again, what would you do differently, I guess? You know, I think the most, the most complicating thing that we had was the timeline. And if we went wrong anywhere, it was perhaps by not creating a narrow enough scope for the timeline that we had. Um, I don't think that there's anything that we would do fundamentally different, but there are always learning elements. I mean, this is the first school in New Zealand, first secondary high school in New Zealand that's gone Linux from end to end. So there's always going to be a lot of learning in that. There's always going to be a lot of, hey, maybe it would have been better so if we did it again, would we do anything fundamentally different? No. There'd be some polishing, there'd be some tweaks, there would be things that we'd do differently. I think we'd probably do it a lot faster, to be honest, now that we know some of the pitfalls. Um, there's also been some development work go into some of the tools. Um, we're working through some phase two stuff with Albany at the moment um, in terms of, say, managing ALDAP users and that sort of thing. So um, the hope would be that that would be contributed back to the community as well. Right, we've got time for one more question, which seems to be from... Um, just noting, your student management system, you noted before, was running on Windows 2008. How do you integrate that into your into the staff desktops? How do you actually get that working? I know that's an issue we're facing at, um, at the place where I work. Okay, the simple answer is badly. Um, <laughs> the technical answer is with newer versions of our desktop, you can do seamless application delivery. So um, there's a flag, uh, a minus I or something, to um, our desktop that um, enables you to say, use this as your shell when you connect to the user uh, to the server. So it's terminal services, essentially, is the simple answer. Um, so there are some cows there, but it's just for teachers, so it's a smaller amount. Um, in terms of technical detail around that, actually, um, Brajesh, if you could stand up. Brajesh is... Um, Basically, uh, he works, he's, uh, works for Albany as on-site support, on-site engineer uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, have a talk to Brajesh because he was involved in, in making that work for the teachers. Well, thank you very much. Um, and next, guys, we have the, I believe, last presentation, as in the ending. Okay. So, round of applause. Can I do it? Run, run, stampede! There we go, people that can throw, fantastic. Okay, here we go, look out. <laughs>